And it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's uh, speaker, John J. Leaños. <laughs> the website he's got it phonetically spelled out. <laughs> who's going to be speaking on decolonial rendering, art, history, and transformation. John describes himself as a Chicano mestizo, new media artist. He's a professor in film and digital studies, digital media department, uh, where he teaches courses on the politics of culture, new media, social documentation. His practice includes a range of film, animation, public art, installation, new media, and performance, focusing on the conversions of memory, social space, and decolonization. Central to John's art practice and cultural work lies the investigation of the documentary as a transformative, discursive system where subaltern histories, untold stories, and decolonial perspectives arise in fiction and non-fiction forms. His research explores the slippery slope of the documentary within the discursive spaces of the public sphere, media outlets, the virtual sphere, the museum, and gallery. John has made animated films and they've been shown all over the world at various film festivals. Uh, he's also done installation work and has been has, has exhibited throughout the United States at the Whitney, at the Oakland Museum, uh, museums in Mexico, as well as museums in San Francisco. He also has a multimedia mariachi opera, um, <laughs> which was performed in New York uh, and in Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, John is very creative, as we'll soon find out. Um, before he came to UC Santa Cruz, he was at Arizona State University and at the Community Arts at the California College of the Arts. <coughs> he has various, numerous publications in, uh, in various uh, professional journals as well as a creative and art journal. Not that they're not professional. Um, uh, so it gives me great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, John, who's only been here since uh, 2010, 29? 29. 29. 29. So he's got 10 years uh, here at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, so he's one of our younger uh, uh, faculty members, a professor in film and digital media. Thank you all. I appreciate it. It's, it's a really an honor to be here in probably one of my most, uh, uh, one of the biggest brained audiences I've ever come across here. This is uh, fantastic. I, I admire all of you. I really want to be where you're sitting right now. Um, but there's much work to do um, in here on campus and in the world. Um, and OK, I, uh, yeah, can you hear me OK? I'll try to. Uh, I, I do speak softly. So if you can't hear me, just kind of put up your hand and let me know. And I will try to speak louder, no? Um, so um, I'm essentially a, a Californio here. Um, and I, uh, I was born in Southern California um, most of my life in San Francisco. Um, my, my father is, from, is Mexicano, Chicano, and also native Californian, Chumash. Um, my mother is of Italian, American, Lithuanian descent. Um, uh, so yeah, a big mestizo, a big mixed up. Uh, my, my pronouns are he and, and, and him, and also we and our, giving it up to the ancestors in this great collaborative thing we call life. Um, so as a Chicano native, white passing, mestizo, güero, borderlands media artist, um, I'm really concerned with the decolonial strategies and how to, how to uh, uh, use artwork to, uh, to communicate uh, with, for, and by a na mostly a la la Latinx and native audiences, right? And so a lot of the times in, in the art world and, and in also in, in institutions such as these, we focus on the aesthetics, form, and, and processes of art, art, artwork. Um, 
But I come from the Chicanx uh, 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 civil rights movement, which, which really embeds in us this notion that art is for uh, larger communities. It has a larger purpose. It has a social purpose, right? It has a function within, within transformation, not only personal, but also social. Um, so I, I view my work in the field of public pedagogy, right? Art in the, in the public realm with the, inf- with the intention of, of teaching, with the intention of transformation, using a, a range of uh, art production, discourse and new media, animation, documentary, public art, installation, radio, performance, opera, any and all media necessary, uh, focusing on the convergence of memory and history and also decolonization, right? Um, but let's see, before uh, I get into my work, I wanted to bring up one issue here, which is, um, I wanted to look at this here, which is the, uh, the land acknowledgement, which is a, a new uh, a statement coming, out from, coming from the chancellor, which is uh, becoming more and more popular um, among uh, liberal uh, settlers who um, usually be before... We, we gather, we give a land acknowledgement to the, to the indigenous people here. People have, have used this before, maybe? Yeah, some. So um, there's something really interesting here. You know, on the one hand, this practice can be an awakening, right? It can be, it can be taking baby steps towards the acknowledgement, per, uh, perseverance, and continuance of indigenous people of this land, right? On the other hand, um, and this has really been a critique from indigenous scholars the land acknowledgments can also ring hollow, right? They can function as a sort of a self-administered amnesty, um, a de- declaration uh, meant to appease or placate white liberal guilt or, um, or a reconciliation without reckoning, as Rick Harp s- states. So uh, if you look at here, we have a, a couple of things here. We have um, the Amu uh, uh, Mutsun tribe being uh, recognized here. Let me see if I can turn this on. All right. So, so we have the, the Mutsun Nation, and they are, they're na- named, I think, once, and then twice here, and then three times. I just wanted to mention that there, there's a pleito with a lot of local indigenous uh, tribes, and so for, for the uh, Aba Mutsun to be named here is great. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Valentin Lopez and all of that, and it seems like the, the university has met with him, but... For them, there's also uh, uh, tribes that are left out. So that's, that's a political issue that I'm not really, I just wanted to bring up. But what I really wanted to talk about um, was uh, this statement here, where the, it says the Muslim nations whose ancestors were taken to the Mission Santa Clara and Mission San Juan Bautista during the Spanish colonization, which is uh, great. Okay, but what is missing here? <laughs> yeah, they were enslaved. Yeah, they were enslaved. Yeah, what else is missing? Because we talk about the Spanish, right? Okay. I think really what is miss, what is missing here is Amer- the the American settler complicity really in the murder, enslavement and genocide of California Indians between 1846 and 1873. And for this not to be mentioned here is quite a, a, a big deal, right? And so when I, when I say genocide, uh, we, we are not um, kind of using that lightly. We mean violence. We mean direct killing, intentional, repetitive killing of people, hunting down human beings. Uh, this is all sanctioned by and facilitated by California officials with the intent to destroy in part or whole the a whole ethnic and racial group. Um, there are forced removals, abductions, separations of children from families, slave raiders, forced sterilizations that happened and lasted until the 1970s. And in case in point, we have our first uh, California governor, right? Uh, your boy, uh, Peter Burnett, uh, who was an original American uh, a, on the uh, Oregon Trail. He was a land grabber. He, he legislated uh, that black people could not live in Oregon before, um, I guess, we decided that he'd be a good California governor. Um, he was a racist judge, a, more, a money extortionist, a.k.a. a banker, um, and he endorsed um, this uh, genocide here um, in several spaces, right? So uh, between 1846 and 1873, uh, uh, about 80% of all California Indians had died, many uh, to massacres, leaving no survivors, right? The 
um, the state of California paid up to $1.5 million in vouchers uh, to people who would turn in scalps, body limbs, baby arms to, um, to the state. And they would get these vouchers and they would get paid off in the bank for, for these. So $1.5 million in, 18, in 1870s. There's a lot of ways to calculate uh, you know, inflation. But they're roughly between $800 million and a $1 billion that was paid out in our state for the, the extermination of uh, indigenous people between the, that time, right? Um, and this was uh, reimbursed by the U.S. federal government to the state of California. It came out to about um, over $1,000 per scalp, um, uh, per murder in, uh, in today's dollars, right? Um, so we, we have to think of this is all documented. Uh, Benjamin Madley uh, just came out of a book in 2017 uh, out of UCLA. He, he documented all of these murders. He said it was, it was just hidden in plain sight. There were all in the newspapers. It was all being reported on the daily what was happening. And so we kind of think about what, the ideas of complicity um, in in our uh, in in this this history, the California governor governor, governor Newsom just uh, made history uh, by formally apologizing to the native Californians for this brutal genocide and the, the war of extermination, um, it, which was a which was a big surprise and big uh, admission. Uh, but it really uh, kind of rang also hollow for a lot of indigenous people who have um, a, a, who are kind of dealing with this the, this kind of legacy of the work. So all of this is, is to say that, that UCSC needs to do better here in our acknowledgement of, of, of land and, and also to, to give um, you know, homage to uh, the people of the land as well. Um, so with, with that, I would, want to, I would want to play a game. Do you like to play a game real quick? Can we play a game? Sure. Okay, good. <laughs> I've got some game players here. All right, so uh, this is a very quick game. Everybody can play. Tech people, people working here, everybody can play. And I just want you to, it's a mnemonic game. And all you have to do is uh, uh, two things. The first thing is to, I'm going to give you about 10 seconds, um, to list or think of as many Greek and Roman gods and goddesses as we can, right? Zeus and Apollo and etc. There are about 12 primordial deities, several dozen other descendants of Titans and from the culture of about 3,000 years ago. So think about them. Give you 10 seconds to think about them and, and count them up. As many Greek and Roman <laughs> gods and goddesses as we can. Okay, you have more or less a number. Okay, so now let's uh, do the second part of the game is to think of as many California Indian tribes as we can, the names of the tribes, right? And I, I, I would ask you to be equivalent to say, okay, name the same amount of deities, right? But that would be kind of a trick question. Um, so a name as many in your head, California Indian tribes as you can. Over 500 individual bands, there are about 100 major tribes, 250 um, who existed and thrived over uh, 250 years ago. So, so is it safe to say that your list of Greek deities is much longer than your list of <laughs> California Indian tribes? Is that true? Maybe so. Um, so this is a lose-lose game. Nobody wins. Everyone loses. It is a game with, which ends with a rhetorical question which is, why is that we know so much more about the religions of a culture that existed thousands of years ago and thousands of miles away, and we can't even name a few of, a few of the hundreds of thousands of people populated these lands in the earth beneath our feet. And we see that, uh, that Native California presence, Native history here, does, is not considered history. It's, it's been erased from the narrative of, narrative of California. Um, and our collective historical memory has been curated, right? It's been colonized and framed to see certain things and ignore certain others as well. So white American settlers bestow upon themselves in the sense um, the right to maintain this willful ignorance, right? A belief in, in our inherent goodness and benevolent authority while strategically forgetting inconvenient truths that may complicate these unifying narratives. In mythic America, the harsh realities of genocide, slavery, gender and sexual violence, stolen land dispossession, extractionism, white supremacy, mass incarceration, all these remain prescriptively hushed, not dealt with, removed from memory, and pushed to the past, past rather. 
And there are a myriad of reasons and, and learned habits that are um, uh, the cause of this, normalizing privilege and, and wealth and land and access that enable the white American settler so deftly to, to disassoci disassociate themselves from their own checkered past, to say the least. And one can fathom how settlers have unconsciously built historical amnesia into the foundation of the American project, right? So the doctrine of discovery uh, really la laid the, found the legal foundation for the, the land grab, as well as um, a, the looking at this um, a, the space as terra nullius, right? This seizure of va vast lands and ultimately the displacement of mass murder of indigenous people. Uh, which culminated in the, uh, in the genocide of California Indians. So the white settler, white American settler psyche, as we saw today, there's a, another shooting down in, in Southern California at a school, right, um, is under great stress, right? It's showing acute symptoms of a disassociative amnesia disorder, a disassociative path pathology passed on from generation to generation that continues to surface in the form of America's steadfast tradition of murderous violence, as evidenced in the mass shootings in Gilroy, California over here, and El Paso, Texas, the murderous racialized pathologies of the American settler continue to, continues to hemorrhage, right? as haunting the nation's alt-right, as, as, as Trump's alt-right engages in race warfare. So we know today that Adolf Hitler drew inspiration from the American West, right? We, the United States uh, policies of displacement, dispossession, and incarceration of Native Americans uh, served as a model for the Holocaust. Um, walking the streets of Germany today, however, Pedestrians may stumble across these brass plates embedded in the cobblestones, roads, and pathways. Um, each of these are Stolperstein public art projects. Has anybody seen any of these in, in Germany? Yeah, okay, you, you run across them, right? Yeah, so uh, um, these are stumbling blocks, right? And there's, there's uh, um, some interesting a reason why they're called stumbling blocks, but they document, uh, locate, and memorialize the victims in gen of genocide and displacement during the Holocaust between 1933 and 1945. The Stolperstein pu uh, Public Art Project has laid over 70,000 um, uh, markers throughout Europe as a way of giving presence to the trauma to address the ghosts, the pain, the healing. Uh, this historically engaged work is part of uh, the, the German process of, and I'm going to butcher this German, excuse me, it's a Vergangenheitsbewartengung. I don't know, that was pretty bad, no. Which is a coming to terms with the, uh, with the studying, analyzing, and learning, and living with the Holocaust. The historical reckoning with this, ga with this ghastly past is, has become a social truth-telling project for, the, for, the, for Germany, um, and is practiced in schools, churches, art, media, literature, so as to remember, so as to learn from and prevent such atroc atrocities from repeating. Um, I'm not really deluded. I know that there has been a rise of neo-Nazis in, in Germany. There's definitely a reaction, but it, it is the process that, I'm, uh, that, uh, that is taking place that I'm interested in here. The process of struggling to overcome uh, the past or working through the past, right? Um, and Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission also deals with, with also very problematic, um, but also dealt with this. Uganda's Umuganda was also our, uh, another example of how publics have compelled their nation to attempt uh, an, a reckoning with the genocidal past. White American settlers, conservative and liberal alike, have a different logic, unfortunately. And this is one of denial, defensiveness, disassociation, even crass dismissiveness. The average white American settler does not even consider himself a settler, right? So, I mean, some of you might say, oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm from here. I'm native California, you hear that a lot. Um, so there's this kind of nativist claim, this, re this return to this is my country, this is my homeland, I'm defending my, my land. So in doing so, we erase indigenous land and life and sovereignty and futurity. So the logic of white American settler dictates that, well, we won, right? You've heard this before. Oh, well, we won, and to, to I question, like, you won the genocide, you won the transatlantic slave trade, you won the land theft, what did you win exactly? As we witness the triumph of the neo-Darwinistic approach to history making, right? Where winning is all that matters, and who wins by, by whatever means necessary is ultimately right. 
It seems as if the settler has won the right to forget. Settler forgetfulness has gone viral here in, in, in America as American amnesia is practiced in schools, in literature, in churches, in advertising, in film, in art, in media, so as not to learn. The American landscape remains littered with the monuments uh, equally to Spanish conquistadores, right? Canonized Franciscan missionaries with blood on their hands, Robert E. Lee statues, Confederate statues, buildings and schools honoring the names of murderous uh, American settlers. And the United States continues to ignore truth, reconciliation, reparations, and retribution. Has anybody seen this? This is what is this? A, this is a, a, a lynching at Water Street Bridge here, and in, in, it's a famous uh, in, photograph. Um, but there are many other lynchings and uh, uh, racialized violence that happened around uh, in, in Santa Cruz during this time. Uh, one of my students is working on uh, the, the Chinese uh, documentary animation on the, the Chinese. Uh, uh, um, expulsion from, from Santa Cruz. And the, the, the city of Santa Cruz really is, is a white space. If you bring people of color here, you, I've dropped uh, people, folks of color off downtown and they've texted me and saying, hey man, this looks like a scene from the movie Get Out, uh, which uh, is true in a lot of ways. Um, but we are, you, uh, for, for students of color continuously like here, uh, UCSC is also a white space and, and uh, folks of color try to integrate into it and have a difficult time. While we are uh, a Hispanic serving institution with over 30% Latinx students, we have still under 10% of the Latinx faculty and many of them are white, teen white Tinos like myself, um, uh, less than 2% native, 6% uh, black, um, a faculty, the, the racial inequality and lack of non-white -rep representation <laughs> in the upper administration is even, is even worse, right? Um, and for, for, uh, it, it is uh, rampant across the UC system, which remains the largest employer in the state of California, right? Uh, we just had a, a UC-wide strike yesterday, right, for the folks who are um, servers, and they are, the, they are the brown and black people who are serving us, and they are also the lowest paid. Um, so this is really um, a, a deep problem. Uh, bringing this up, uh, which I do often, uh, does not make me very popular in my faculty because it, it, does, it reflects, uh, it reflects a, a kind of an elephant in the room. And um, I pay the price, or rather my pay is less um, uh, because of it, but it's okay. I'm not here to make a uh, killing. I'm here to make a living, um, as Howard Zins would say. So particularly, uh, but in, in the larger scope, particularly for Chicano and indigenous, indigenous decolonial projects, we find ourselves in over 500 years of settler colonial layering, where language, knowledge systems, and culture have been imp imp implanted over the colonial subject. It's, tac it's tactics being erasure, strategic forgetting, genocide, exclusion, infiltration, slavery, displacement, deportation, mass incarceration, forced labor, extractionism, on and on, right? And so we, this isn't really a history lesson or, or you know, an indictment on the failures of diversity in the university, but we uh, uh, should think about um, Lucy Lepard's a reminder um, that no matter where you, we are coming from, you, we, you have to know where you are, right? Um, uh, because a, a lot of us, no matter where we, we come from, we, have, we are, have been and continue to be colonized by a Judeo-Christian pan-capitalist military industrial entertainment prison university complex, right? <laughs> um, one that is like steeped in white supremacy, neoliberal mindsets, exploitation, um, greed, and, and genocide as well. So it is in this context that I would like to remember and bring presence to our ancestors, to my ancestors here, to the sacred land, this beautiful space here that we're uh, um, happy and comfortable in, um, to the Ohlone, the Esalen, the Amumatsun, the, the, the Miwok, and other Cali California indigenous peoples who have a history here and have many lessons for our global, a time of global climate crisis and, and um, a crisis of human relations. So, I'm an artist, uh, and my work, as I said, is how do we affect change, right? And the idea, a big question in, in, in my field is how do we really kind of affect 
material change. And so we, we look at uh, art must, uh, having to do something that must help or support or serve or work with or for communities. It must be engaged and within alliance with uh, the disenfranchised uh, to bring voice to folks that have none or to, to at least kind of uh, gesture towards it. So many times artists work in the symbolic arena um, and as independent producers of, of culture. And it is true that we, we must do more. The artists can do more, as, as Howard Zinn says, and the, the artists should do more. And not only that, it, we, but more, as he says. Um, so many of us are, are, are involved in, in teaching and writing and making films and plays. And, and it is really um, our, our responsibility as, as citizens to not only do this, but also to, to, uh, uh, to kind of understand the context in which we find ourselves, right? And right now, today, we really find ourselves at, um, at the edge of the, in the larger national picture of, of an authoritarian, authoritarian corporate state where there seems to be widespread, widespread disdain for democracy, a deep-seated belief that government and universities like this should at least be run like a business, right? Um, this authoritarian influence has given the Trump presidency, um, a, has, has, has given us the Trump presidency, right? It, which is the sum of society's va vanity, miseducation, greed, and nihilism, which will inevitably lead to states of war, or at least what uh, cultural theorist Stuart Hall calls authoritarian populism, in which black and brown and native people will continue to be policed and deported and killed and imprisoned. Inequalities will continue to grow wor worldwide. Dissenters will be continue to be policed by the politically correct right and their regressive I I identity politics. White supremacy, sexism, sexism ultranationalism, religious rivalries, homophobia, xenophobia, among other very American deadly passions, will continue to thrive. The, so this context, combined with a normalized violence, symbolic and real, a militarized mentality, with a large, we have the largest uh, military state and the largest police state, the largest carceral state, as well as a, a, a living legacy of white supremacy. It is no surprise that civic engagement, activism, and even art seeking social justice and social responsible, responsibility is often met with scorn and even, even violence, right? I didn't come here to have, cause you indigestion, though, because there are spaces, uh, but spa because spaces of social death are not inevitable, there are always alternatives, right? hubs of, of collective resistance, new forms of political engagement, barrios libres de la imaginación, and this is where artists come in, you know, the underappreciated, the underfunded, the economically marginalized, socially engaged artist. Um, and we are working in, in, in and outside of the art world, um, collaborating with grassroots activists and leaders, intellectuals, researchers as well. So I'm going to uh, uh, run through, a, um, oh, this is really this, uh, uh, the statement about uh, decolonization is um, the approach to uh, dismantle, disrupt, and, de and deconstruct colonial history as it has been impressed upon us. Um, but we're going to run through uh, some, some projects really quickly um, to show you kind of like the, the tenor of, of what I do. Um, a, working in the public spaces and trying to engage publics with uh, different uh, moments of history. The San Francisco Historical Circle of the Displace was one in which we used uh, the, the kiosks of San Francisco um, to insert these kind of anti-monuments um, and like looking at the, the resistance of uh, in 1795 of a large group of Ohlone people um, escaping the, the Mission District, the Mission Dolores um, to the East Bay and only with, uh, which, with much difficulty where they kind of some of them hunted down and brought back to it. So moments of resistance, um, but also uh, moments of um, a, um, of legislative uh, violence, right, where the Act for Government and Protection of Indians of 1850 um, allowed for natives who were not really fitting into the gold rush economy or uh, uh, were allowed to be sold on auction, auction blocks in San Francisco, uh, Santa Cruz, and, and beyond, right? And so this, uh, the Indian girls sold for up to $200 at the time, boys sold up to for um, six, $60. Um, so this was a widespread pr practice here. Um, uh, throughout the throughout the California here, 
the policing of lowrider culture in, in, in 1980, uh, Mayor Dianne Feinstein uh, 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 issued a curfew on Mission Street so that uh, the lowriders, who was, which was just a really kind of dynamic, uh, creative, decolonial, uh, uh, taking my, my abuelo's old car and fixing it up and driving it down the street uh, with some flirtation, uh, not in, involved with the gang violence or what have you, um, but it was uh, deemed a, a ill legal, the, the curfew, you can't really have a curfew in the United States, right? So a, after going to the, to, uh, the, is the, um, the courts, we, uh, the, the, the curfew was lifted. Um, but there are stories, I've talked to people who were, who were uh, uh, arrested back in the day, and they said they would, the, the police would arrest you if you were on Mission Street between 11, after 11 p.m., and, and 2 a.m. or 4 a.m., they would pick you up and drive you around in the buggy and drop you off in the sunset after hours, or they'd bring you in or what have you. Um, so it was, you know, a kind of a, a pressing time. I also worked with a, a lot of middle school students uh, in San Francisco. My question was, like, how do these young Latinx, uh, Asian, uh, black, uh, young kids, middle school students fit within a kind of a globalized uh, um, tech economy that is, that is uh, exploding and also kind of passing them by at the same time. And so we did a project called Mapping Myself, which is, uh, and we put them on, on kiosks in public spaces. Uh, and I gave them cameras. This was before digital. Um, and, and, I, and I told them to document their lives. And we did end up doing these um, uh, rather, I think, really beautiful uh, 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 construct of, of themselves and people were kind of these are in advertising spaces so people were kind of confused what exactly we were selling and the, the idea was that we're not really selling much but we're, we are kind of talking to about a presence within the within the community and kind of giving back this is linda I saw these saw these uh, these kids uh, many years later and they're like this tall you're like whoa it's a very I bet you understand that. So I also worked with a Latinx group, a collective called Los Cybers, La Raza Tecnocritica, um, back in the late 90s uh, when uh, IT and, and the internet was, was starting to explode. And we were, we called ourselves the, the La Raza Tecnocritica. Um, in, 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 we were kind of lending barrio perspectives to the high-tech rhetoric. Liberals uh, and, and progressives alike were, were really like um, spewing utopian and dystopic paradigms uh, across uh, the, this, uh, this new technology. And we called ourselves techno uh, digger, diggers as reinscribing the insult of uh, Native Americans uh, by Euro-American settlers. And we were t telling people to get off the web um, as soon as possible, and, and sending out false viruses, doing a series of digital murals. Um, this one's called uh, The Digital Divide. Um, this one is about surveillance. Back in, we, we saw, it was very evident back in 1999 that this, these systems were going to be a, an enormous kind of total surveillance apparatus for us all. And, and, what we, and so it, it just came to be um, uh, digital policing um, as well. What we didn't uh, foresee was that um, all of our data would become so profitable, right? And so that that we're, we're kind of giving away all of our data for for profit. This one is the Umakina uh, uh, Manifest Tech Destiny. These are all 24 foot murals that on the street of, of 24th and Bryant in the, in the Mission District. Um, uh, we did performer logs uh, talking about the um, sweatshops and the Hewlett Packard <clears throat> um, uh, work implants here in. Um, in Silicon Valley, performer logs where we, we, would, we would invite uh, speakers to talk and, and do a, a series of work, um, created television shows, this one called Chicano, Chicano, Latino, Latina, Hispanic, Hispanic, Tech TV, which was absurd back then um, because we, it would be absurd to have a, such a television show, but we put it together and we had like Juana Banana talking to Raj Jayadev about HP labor practices as well created music videos, uh, installations where we collected a lot of the uh, tech, techno trash that was uh, being shipped to China. And we, and we, we talked to some of the, 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 the dumps in, in and around the city, and they said, yeah, you could take all of this over here, you know, bring it back, whatever, we don't really care. But that pile, don't, don't take. And that was a pile of motherboards. And the reason, does anybody know why, they're, why they wanted to protect the motherboards? 
Yes, exactly. They have gold in them. So it's like little pieces, the little slivers of gold that were that were shipped to China, broken apart. You know, these release uh, is like uh, 17 different toxins when you break them apart. Um, uh, and we did research, and there and there was a study that said that mostly women and children were doing this work. And so these, uh, you know, kind of looking at the the whole structure of uh, of the uh, of technology and and its um, and its ramifications here. <laughs> Shifting gears, I did. A, I worked with a, a project, a group in uh, from the Galeria de la Raza, um, working on uh, the Days of the Dead, the Los Muertos. And the so Days of the Dead is this decolonial pra- practice, which is kind of across the border, um, and the, and the, the border has crossed it as well. Uh, which is a, an it's, it's a way of, 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 of Mexicanos, of Latinos, kind of sh- sharing um, um, experiences and kind of uh, integrating with uh, their ancestors in a different way, right? Uh, a lot of the times in America, we don't really have a, a process for dealing with death. We have, a, we have our moments of silence, right? Um, but uh, the Chicanex and Mexicano uh, uh, convening with uh, with death is one that is uh, involves uh, discourse, dialogue, humor, play, and so we created this installation called McMortos, uh, which was a little bit of a critique of the appropriation of uh, a, when when a tradition crosses the border into a capitalist society, it becomes consumed um, uh, a, in, inevitably. And, and if you if you go to uh, the Days of the Dead. A celebration in San Francisco these days, you see a lot of uh, people not a part of the culture dressed up in uh, painted in calaca face and white face in a sense, um, which is very interesting. Oops, wrong way. I did a poster for um, a, while I was in Arizona for the fallen soldier Patrick Tillman, who was here from San Jose, right? Um, and his uh, he was a NFL football player for the Arizona Cardinals. He gave up his contract. Um, decided to go to to kill Osama bin Laden. That was his. Uh, ended up realizing that what they were doing over there was not um, exactly what he signed up for. Started to speak up uh, out against the war, um, and then was shot by his own uh, troop. Um, and they say it was an accident. There's a lot of controversy about what it, what happened. Um, but this poster was just say, stating, hey, this was friendly fire. The, the right was using him as a, a, in a pro-war to pr- uh, promote their war in, in, uh, a, in Afghanistan during the Bush administration. Um, a, and for, for me, I, this was just a really kind of basic piece that said, hey, this is, I'm, remember me? I, I, my death was tragic. Um, and when I, I received uh, death threats for this, uh, inv- investigations into my classroom activities uh, and attempts to um, to get my uh, to get my job, uh, people posting my my, ho- my house uh, address and uh, phone calls as well. So it was a pretty in- interesting time, and I began to start to think uh, it was a transformative moment in my in my artistic career. Like, how can I communicate these ideas? Um, these complex ideas uh, without a, a instigating and a, a, a such a and, and getting such a strong reaction, and so I decided to work um, on a Days of the Dead opera, um, which is which we um, called Imperial Silence, um, and we had a folklore. Uh, dancers in, in, in mariachi, which included a mix of uh, a, a son jarocho, uh, f- Mexican folklore, zapateado, and also este, um, a mod- modern dance, right? Um, here are some of the, the, we, the, um, the mariachi oh. singers as well. And with this was a, a series of animations. In, in, this, in this work, um, I, I started to develop a, a work that is um, a documentary animation in a, in a sense. And so this piece, Los ABCs, uh, from my perspective, after getting all those death threats and, and thinking, oh, well, people really need to learn their ABCs of American history, right? And so taking um, from Edward Gorey an homage to uh, Jose Guadalupe Posada, I developed this piece, and this is a short five-minute piece that I'll show. Everyone together, yeah! A is for a boo. 
Working from a documentary animation, we saw that this is a way in which we can uh, use uh, cartoons and animation to kind of recreate these historical moments uh, that are kind of critical uh, in uh, war, perpetual war, right? So B is for Bethlehem, kind of looking at this kind of endless uh, conflict in Palestine, Israeli, and, and taking uh, photographs from, uh, from that. D is for Dow, Cotton, the Toxic Lie. Uh, documents the worst environmental disaster in modern history, the Union Carboid, Carbide Dow Chemical Plant in Bhopal, India, which continues to deform people to this day. Um, F. Frederick hung from a tree, which it really kind of looks at the, the trophy photographs, right? These photographs that over here in the bottom half, left-hand side, who were, who were, that were uh, um, kind of sold at corner stores and kind of celebrated, and people would kind of get their, their uh, gather their, their picnic, right, and, and, and have... Um, Celebration under these um, these lynched humans. S is for the Sikh gunned down at the station. Uh, documents the Sikh immigrant who was shot in Phoenix um, after uh, 911 during the Afghan war. The Sikhs really have nothing to do with this. There's been several cases of, of Sikh violence against Sikhs, right? Um, in uh, uh, because of uh, the the war on terror. Uh, so the third act of this opera was it involved um, a radio piece, and, and we started to think about how we could integrate uh, um, radio uh, into a museum context. Uh, and we collected all of this, uh, a lot of radio from activists, uh, local uh, um, community uh, people, folk, uh, general, just everyday folks, and uh, put it into this uh, Muerto Rider, and it is a 68 um, Impala in which we kind of woodblock cut and, and created a, this uh, piece of work, and people would sit in the, muse in the car and listen to these radio pieces and kind of turn the channel as an alternative radio experience um, um, to it. This, is, uh, this was at the Peterson uh, recently in LA, and it kind of travels around. Uh, it's a functioning car, it's a beast of a machine. Um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of a, 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 a pain for me. But uh, yeah, this was a digital mural of it as well. Um, let me see. Um, and we also uh, did Act 4 was a DNN, uh, Dead News Network. And let me see if I can pull up a, a shot from this here. Oops, where is it at? Was it here? No. Con permiso. Looking for it here. So yes, I'm going to show you a, um, yes, a little clip from this piece. Which seems to have captured the skulls and bones of so this is a, a, a documentary, or just an animation, which, uh, which has the, the precept of what would happen if, uh, the, um, if the dead had a, had a news program that made fun of the living. And so this is one, this is, uh, one project uh, 
Do the people know a Sister Wendy here? You're all from that, right? Sister Wendy from PBS, art historian? Oh, maybe I shouldn't show this one. Uh, I'll, I'll show you. What authorities have described as a gang of irresponsible, lazy, blackmailing hoodlums have broken through the most highly secured institution in the country, the J. Paul Deddy Museum. The so-called Chicanos have pulled off an unimaginable life of dead universe, 18th century, diamond-encrusted human skull valued at more than $100 million. Hearst's skull, made with 8,500 ethnically insensitive diamonds, was on temporary home to the Deddy Museum, for a special exhibit on masonry and Illuminati manuscripts. To decode this unnerving situation, we go dead to special art history correspondent, Sister Wendy, at the J. Paul Deddy Museum to unravel the unexplained Hives of the Hearst. Okay, one other I wanted to show you from the Border Project here. Um, so let's, uh, this was in 2007. Citizens and lawmakers frustrated by multiple failures to build a security fence between the U.S. and Mexico are celebrating a historic deal with Chinese government officials to relocate the Great Wall of China to the U.S.-Mexico border. The Great Wall of China will be airlifted and reconstructed on the southern border of the United States in commemoration of the 138th anniversary of the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad by Chinese volunteers. This border of all borders will create the highly anticipated border entertainment complex center that will include the Republic of Walt Martistan, the Distrito de General Motors, and the Republic of Microsoftia. Also featured will be Minuteman Stadium and the Manifest Destiny Salty Nage Cracker Historical Museum. So that, that's all online if you want to see it. All, all my work is kind of accessible, free online if you wanted to, uh, to, to take a look at it um, 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 as, as well. And I did a project also for the L.A. bus system, um, and they, uh, I was uh, contracted to do a, a short video on the health crisis in L.A., and we started to think about who was engaging uh, on the bus. And basically, if you're, if you're taking the bus in Los Angeles, you're kind of marginalized uh, um, uh, because it is such a car culture. And so we, just, we did a piece um, entitled Evil White Foods, which uh, t- took uh, flour, salt, and sugar on, but at the same time uh, taking on the, the idea of white supremacy and um, I, I, we could see this, or let, let me move on to this piece. Um, you can see that online if you're interested. It's a, it's a little PSA. Um, this piece uh, was a, is called Frontera a Revolt and Rebellion on the Rio Grande. Um, this is a collaboration with artists in New Mexico um, and artists in San Francisco um, thinking about the 1680 Pueblo Revolt. Is, who's heard of the Pueblo Revolt? I'm always curious. I don't know if you steam. Okay, so that's, that's about right. It's, this is uh, uh, what Pueblo scholars call the first American revolution. It is really um, a, a time in history where the, uh, the Pueblos who were uh, several distinct uh, uh, Pueblos, uh, many hundreds of miles away from each other in many cases, um, gathered together in secret and, and planned a rebellion in which they, they expelled the Spanish from the whole region, right, back into 
um, eh, into este, El Paso. And so this is, was really, a, for them, it is the, uh, for the Pueblo people, it is the, the, is the Renaissance uh, moment in which uh, sites of sanctuary were, were established, new art was created, new coalitions formed, and the Pueblos uh, see this moment as, as their, their, their moment for, uh, a, their kind of revolutionary moment in which they still have uh, access and, and um, abilities to control their own destiny because of this moment. So... Let me show you a, a clip from this piece here. This is a 20-minute documentary animation, and I'm going to show you a clip from the end of it. And you can kind of see how I'm, uh, a, for some reason, working with a musical animation as a way of, of communicating and, and using these different uh, art genres to communicate, hopefully, complex ideas. By 1675, the Upper Rio Grande was in crisis. The Spanish Inquisition, sexual violations by soldiers and priests, drought, hunger, and the struggle for power between Spanish clergy and soldiers all led to extreme actions. Open my eye, 1675, Dances of humans, witchcraft, revolt and secret, rebellious we get. Massacre my people, we gon' make it free for it. and break free from this prison. Churches ablaze with the worry to face. We must uplift the race, no matter what's the case. We're gonna take back what's ours and don't leave one detalle. Van a ver que la sangre se derrama por la calle hasta que grita un auxilio socorro. Nunca me corro. My people, we wonder how we survive to stay alive through droughts and hunger. The thunder and rain will wash us again. The survival is tribal. A union is vital. We can stand up to any type of challenge. And when they again will see that our lives All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I wanted to show you one other piece, but I think we're running out of time. So I, I just wanted to. Uh, this is the, the latest piece that I'm working with uh, as an installation at. Um, in, it, it was at Denver. Now it's in um, in Iowa. Um, it is really a, just kind of taking on this uh, night, this uh, the John Gass um, uh, painting and looking at it um, and kind of uh, directing the camera west to. Uh, uh, contradict this notion of terra nullius. Uh, with that, I'm going to end it. I really appreciate your time and your uh, in your presence here. Thank you. Thank you. I went to high school in San Francisco at George Washington High School, which has been the site of a controversy over the past year. Mm -hmm because of the 13 murals by Victor Anatol uh -huh. in the 1930s, uh -huh. uh, criticizing George Washington's practices. I wonder if you want to talk about any of that. 
Yeah, I don't know about that controversy, so I really can't comment upon it. But I, I do know um, that uh, that uh, public discourse and is uh, can be heavy and important uh, to kind of dialogue around artwork. And I think that that's what artwork can do is kind of bring out people for discourse and dialogue um, that hopefully is constructive. You know, so I, I really can't comment on that. But thank you for the for the question. Yeah, well, I'll take a look into it. For sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah, my daughter goes to Lowell, so I, I, I definitely know what uh, high school in, in San Francisco, for sure. We beat you Lowell. <laughs> I bet you did. I bet you did. <laughs> okay, other questions for John? Yes, back there. Hi. I was interested when you showed the Berlin Memorial to the Holocaust, mm-hmm. which are just paving stones. Right. And they're part of everyday life. Sure. Which makes them so impressive. And mm-hmm. I noticed some of your projects are also part of everyday life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But what about the videos and the films you're making? Mm-hmm. How do you feel those might have that same everydayness or can they? Um, yeah, they are in as many kind of venues as I can, right? So, so uh, museums, theater, they've been in theater pieces, they've been in film festivals as well, but they're also online, which is also kind of a continually, for better or for worse, a part of everyday life, right? Um, so, um, uh, so, yeah, you can access them. A lot of filmmakers uh, want to charge for their, they want to make money or kind of sustain their, their uh, work by selling their work online. But um, I just, I, I, I think that it's important to have it accessible to the communities which I'm interested in and, and having inspiring, right? And so um, it's all kind of free if you have, if you have internet access. So there's that. Thank you. Okay. Maybe one last one. Mm-hmm. Right I, I would just like to thank you for your work. Mm-hmm. Thank and, you. Um, mm-hmm. And also, as a member of the Hispanic Survey Institution's mm-hmm. initiative team, mm-hmm. I'd like to invite you to bring your work mm-hmm. into dialogue with and collaboration mm-hmm. with our expanding campus work to include mm-hmm. staff, mm-hmm. all staff, students, um, faculty, and administration in opening up this this institution, this community. Yeah, certainly. It's, it's really great that we are serving more and more Latinx students. I see more and more coming through, even through the film department. Um, and, uh, one thing that I do see is a, a, a little bit cynical. Every, every time uh, administrator or faculty say that they're HSI, this didn't happen now, um, uh, that we are HSI, the next sentence, 90% of the time, is... That and we've received federal funding from because of this, right? So it seems like this kind of cynical neoliberal logic that happens that we are uh, oh we're not not, be, not that we're serving this kind of soon to be majority population in California, but rather that oh now we can get these extra funds. Um, so I uh, it's a you know a bigger picture. I think we have to look at some of the times uh, when we're when we're looking at education here, upper, higher education. Yeah, no? and a please, um, please. Uh, we- Okay, we're, we did get funds, uh-huh. uh, we have them, uh, but the paradox is that not getting funds can open up the opportunities for a greater inclusion and collaboration and institutional transformation. Interesting. And that's exactly what is happening right now, uh-huh. um, and it's a very exciting case. So you said not getting funds can open up these possibilities? Yes, because, uh-huh. because mm-hmm. it's not just the federal, you know, Okay. So then it, the, the, then it becomes um, an opportunity for others to participate to be treated. It's not always about right. the money surprise. Right. And so I think that actually that's, that is now underway on campus. Mm. Great. So I, Great. I do that in the spirit then that it's not about the money. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much, John. Thank you. And yes. we hope to see you all in January. Right on. Thank you all. Thank you.